This is a little excerpt of some of what I've written for the book, um, talking about traveling when I was younger. I don't know if you can hear how fucking obnoxiously loud it is out here. <laughs> mm. <laughs> oh, God damn it. I didn't know it when I was young, not consciously. How addicted to the feeling of the road that I had become making these cross-country treks. The first time I ever got my period was right before hitting the road in 2011. We were headed back to Maryland from California. I bled so heavy it soaked through all the layers effortlessly. I had to frequently and discreetly change my pad without anyone noticing, just to feel clean. Freshening myself with wet napkins, I discard in a bag at my feet so as to not annoy my dad by asking for stops we didn't really need. I bled along these journeys, new parts of my youth growing up to the changing landscapes all around me. The truck stops we wandered into became a familiarity that I leaned towards with comfort as if they were my own living room. It seemed like the truck stops were a little cooler when I was young. Maybe that's just my nostalgia for my youth. Or maybe it's because Flying J and Loves have taken over the entire highway system. I loved all the mom and pop shops that served real food, local ingredients made with real love. I would sneak off to the gift shops to look at the local arts and treats, watching the options change and vary as we made miles. In the deep south, I'd find just about anything you could ever pickle sold in large mason jars alongside moonshine and endless varieties of sauces and jams, alligator and camel jerky sharing the same shelves as taxidermy knickknacks and dirty joke books, watching the colorful lights of the small highway towns become distant until there was nowhere to pull off, except the occasional rest stop, the unsettling greenish-yellow flicker of the bathroom lights, sometimes lit in largely liminal spaces that made you feel like you could disappear within them somehow even all alone. Shutting the stall door to see a poster with a young girl's face on it that says, you see a girl who could do anything. He sees a girl who can force to do anything. Unsettling in its own way, though I had already made a cross-country trip alongside a man who had been sexually abusive to me. I would imagine a reality where I didn't have to sit so closely to someone who made my skin crawl. I'd imagine what it'd be like to be in a quiet desert, a predator, slinking through the hills silently without fear. I'd imagine what it'd be like to have teeth so big and claws so sharp, I'd easily part the hand from the body of any man who tried to touch me like some secret pet to keep. On my final trek with my family in 2014 from Virginia to California, I learned a lot about myself. In Virginia, I said goodbye again to another piece of my childhood. On Highway 80, I aspired to be a writer or a teacher or happy. At a laundromat in Colorado, I found out I didn't know my biological father at all. And through the salt flats in Utah, I watched strangers lick the ground laughing. I loved when I got to ride the shotgun. It was the best part of being the oldest. Late one night, rolling quickly through the deserts of Nevada, I sat in the passenger seat next to my dad and stared out at the stars dancing about above the mountain range at the open vastness running out for miles beside us. Hotel California came on the radio and I chuckled until I took notice of my dad's reflection in the window and I started to cry silently. I didn't really want this feeling to change, but I was in the midst of change regardless. We always are. Whenever I embark on these familiar roads as an adult, I'm reminded of all the core memories. Hotel California with my dad in Nevada it wasn't me by Shaggy crossing the California border with my ma and brothers, laughing so hard next to the Truckee River. I find myself driving past my childhood with people I consider my gifted family. When you're present in a mo moment, everywhere your feet take you is sacred, divine. In this present moment, in Northeast Texas, within the wood walls of this diner that encapsulate our bodies, our hearts, our laughter, they might as well be the walls of some faraway temple, standing alone, strong and protected, on some mountain somewhere. They mean the same thing. They hold the same sanctity, because they are each other. Anytime our presence, our here 
finds a meeting point, even silently, even for a moment, that is sacred. This cigarette right now is divine. Um, hi. I recorded a whole thing just now and I just fucking can't. My girlfriend is in California now, um, for a funeral. The van is fucked. We've been working on it nonstop since I got here. It's not ended once. Um, that's just how it goes. That's how it goes. Did you know gasoline vehicles are like obsolete anyways? That we've been forced into this corner and like they don't fucking hardly make parts for these vehicles. You realize? Does anyone realize this? Ah, they don't, they don't make the parts anymore. And when they do, they're plastic and they're trash. So you're going to be replacing those bitches fucking constantly. And you can do anything. You can do anything. If you really, really want it, you can do it. It's just exhausting. Um, I've literally saved up hundreds of dollars. It's all gone into the van. For the fucking repairs, for the registration, the license plate. I've... The OF. That was another thing I mentioned in the video I originally recorded. I'll only be working on uh, Telegram. It's the only place you'll see my thighs, so... We're starting to get real concerned that it might be a head gasket, and I'm really hoping that it's not, because this van barely has any miles on it, and there should be no reason why things are this bad. Ooh, ooh. This is the longest I've been in a home in so long, and... I'm trying to just be grateful for it because I have had the opportunity to do spicy work and just be able to throw money towards my partner's van and rest. Um, to be honest, I don't think rest is something that ever actually happens and is so much harder for some reason for me to try and sleep in this bed than anything. Like, I've been tr just, I feel so like people invite you into their space and they're like yeah fucking come here you're welcome like we love you it's so good you deserve this rest and then it's like i feel so guilty because i i can't even relax <laughs> i get feeling guilty because um i have invisible disabilities and chronic pain that no one can see it's just inside me and family members have been pressing me to do what they do, whatever they do may be. Pressuring my partner to do whatever they do and whatnot to obtain what they think we need to move on. To be honest, it would make me feel like so much lighter if we could somehow just like float away from here like i would need my backpack and i feel less stressed they really think that i'm gonna spend my time like that nope even if i physically could mentally i just could not do that listen me in the workplace leads to trouble because if i'm there we're all leaving we're all leaving let me read this to you i'm just gonna read um some of the stuff that I wrote yesterday for the book I've been working on. Um, this chapter talks a lot about growing up in the military industrial complex um, as a way of escaping potential poverty or like worsening poverty. I also talk about what the privileges are and disadvantages are for me personally. Oh, also that the biggest privilege of the military experience is the diversity I had witnessed through traveling. I would have not seen or listened to the voices of so many people of color without being around their communities and without having a youthful and open heart to hear that without bias. Because let me tell you, even like, there's so much bias, so much racism, so much fucking bullshit. Children